Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Emmy Vadness, co-host with Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is healing trauma with dreams. My guest is Linda Yael Schiller, who's a psychotherapist who specializes in trauma and grief. She integrates traditional therapeutic styles with dream work, energy psychology, body-based modalities, and spirituality. She is author of Modern Dream Work, New Tools for Decoding Your Soul's Wisdom, and PTS Dreams, Transform Your Nightmares from Trauma Through Healing Dream Work. Linda is based in Watertown, Massachusetts, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Linda. It's such a pleasure to have you with us today. Thanks so much, Emmy. A pleasure to be here. Dreams are rich with imagery and sometimes even messages, and many people like to interpret their dreams. You found that people can heal from trauma through dreams. Yes, that's correct. How did you get into discovering how one can do this? I'm a psychotherapist, and I'm a, a professional in treating trauma, and I've studied a variety of different methods of trauma treatment over the last 40 years. So I've had a lot of experience working with people who have both personal and now, of course, global trauma in their lives as well. And at the same time, I've also been a student of dream work, and I've been studying and practicing dream work, again, for close to 40 years. And as I learned more and more about both how our unconscious mind works and about how our brain works as well, and the, the neuroscience in our brain, I realized that our dreams do come through with messages for us, with images for us, with stories for us that are there for a reason, and they're there with meaning. And over the years, I've seen these two strands of my work come together so that the dream work that I do with other people, with myself. I've been in my own dream circle for almost 40 years. Um, we see how life events, whether they're from the, from yesterday, from a month ago, from a year ago, or from our childhood or possibly other lives show up in our dreams. And by working with and understanding and listening to the messages of our dreams, we can then change our lives, literally. How would you define trauma? It's an interesting question because it's, in some ways, it's a, a personal um, response to difficult life events. So there's a DSM, which stands for the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, which is kind of like the Bible in the psychotherapy profession, that defines trauma as difficult, upsetting events that we feel out of control in and that we have negative emotional responses to that happen either to ourselves or to people close to us. And trauma is something that could be what we call big T trauma or little t trauma. So little things that happen can be sort of mini traumas in your life. You have a fender bender and your car is kind of smashed up, but luckily no one's hurt. As long as you don't have a history of lots and lots of accidents, that's probably a small T trauma. But if you were in a war zone, that would be a big T trauma. Um, on a personal level, if you grow up in a family where you had good enough parents, but they weren't really terrific, and sometimes one of them drank too much, but they weren't violent when they did, they would fall asleep, or they'd embarrass you and be really silly, there's probably some developmental trauma along the line there, but it would not be as extreme as if you grew up in a really dysfunctional, multi-problem family with extremes of abuse and neglect. So there's an example of different types of both public and private traumas that we might experience in different ways. And how did you discover that using dreams could help someone heal their trauma? There are three kinds of dreams that I talk about. There's, there's dreams, there's bad dreams, and then there are nightmares. A dream is something that is neutral, fun, pleasant, 
interesting where your emotional response in the dream is, this is cool, or this is fun, or I like this, or oh, how interesting. That's a regular dream. A bad dream is a response that's upsetting, but not terribly upsetting. It might have dark or scary figures. You might feel a little bit nervous or a little bit anxious, but you're not feeling helpless or out of control. A nightmare then is where the emotional narrative that goes along with the dream story is one that evokes difficult, frightening emotions where the dreamer feels out of control, terrified, enraged, um, drowning in grief and sadness, where if we look at, like when you go to the doctor's office and they say, how big is your pain rated on a scale of zero to 10, zero being I'm calm and relaxed and 10 being I'm in agony. If we, and in psychotherapy, that's called the SUD scale. And SUDS stands for subjective unit of distress. So if your SUDS is below five, you're probably in the realm of a bad dream. And if your SUDS is up to seven, eight, nine, you're probably in the realm of a nightmare where you're having a large emotional response to the dream. A large negative emotional response, that is. Is every nightmare indicative of trauma? No. There could be many reasons why we would have nightmares, and some of them are simply developmental. Um, children go through a period of time in their life where it's developmentally normative for them to be having nightmares. Because if we think about it, you know, little people, children, live in a world where there are big people who are all more powerful and have more control over them in their lives. So they don't have a lot of self-efficacy to make decisions and choices on their own. So they do experience the world sometimes as a scary place. That isn't necessarily a trauma response. That's a response to being a small person without power living in a world where everybody else has the power. So that's one developmental stage. Then if we look at adolescence, that's a time when we're finding our identity and exploring who we are and what we are. And that's always been a challenging time for most people, if many, if not most people. Um, and in the last several years between COVID and the violence we're living with and climate change and all the other things that are big T dramas in the world, adolescence has become an even harder life stage to navigate. So we see adolescents who are responding both to their own development as well as to world situations having nightmares where the trauma wasn't necessarily personal, but it's the intersection between a normal developmental stage and what they're living through in the world. So those would be examples of what I we call developmental um, trauma, developmentally induced nightmares, not trauma induced. And then you can eat a bad oyster or have indigestion and that can cause a nightmare. Um, hormonal changes can cause nightmares. Pregnant women pre often talk about these crazy dreams and nightmares that they have. Women once a month when they're premenstrual and they have a lot of different levels of hormones in their body often talk about how their dreams are different and reflect that. So there could be a number of different reasons for the nightmares, but the repetitive ones, the ones that are most terrifying and that don't go away easily are often connected to some kind of traumatic event. In your book, you share about how you yourself have had dreams that you would consider nightmares. Right. I, I'm very fortunate that I've had very, very few in my life. And in the book, I talk about two that were memorable to me, one from childhood and one from just a couple of years ago. And in the nightmare I had from childhood, it was a repetitive nightmare that lasted, I don't know, a couple of years, I think, came off and on. And in that dream or nightmare, I was up in, it was either an airplane or a helicopter, with my dad and my brother. And there was some like bad people there who were going to like chop us into bits or cut us into bits. And that was the dream. And I imagine that when I was young and I first had it, I had stronger feelings about it. But as an adult, I didn't really have strong feelings anymore because I had sort of worked through or resolved whatever it was about. And I didn't know what it was about for the longest time. 
But um, a couple of years ago, I was in my dream circle, the group of women who I've been meeting with, and we work on and, and explore dreams with each other. And I didn't have sort of a fresh dream to look at. So I said, well, let me pull this one out, because I, I never did figure out what it what it really was about. And in conversation with my friends, it turned out like, oh, I had this dream around the time that my parents got divorced, when my family was being cut into pieces. And that aha of recognize that even, you know, 50 years or more later, gave me a sense of closure on that dream that was more than I had had before, even though it hadn't been bothering me at all in years, the understanding of the connection was like, oh, so that's what that's about. And I could put it to rest even more fully. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the dreams that I talked about in the book from childhood. Yeah. And you also share one about coming up from water and gasping for air. Right. Clearly, you've read the book and remember it well. <laughs> Uh, right. That was a few years ago. And as I said before, I'm one of the lucky people that I tend not to have nightmares hardly ever, um, probably because, you know, as a psychotherapist, I've, <laughs> I've done a lot of my own work and healing. And plus, I get to sit with people every day and listen and support and hold them in their stories and their work. And when I'm holding someone who's working through whatever distress they're coming through with, I'm doing vicarious healing at the same time. So I think that's probably why I don't have very many nightmares. But this one happened a few years ago, and I didn't know what it was about. It is exactly as you said, in my dream, I'm coming up from underwater, and I'm not sure if I'm going to get to the surface before I run out of air. And I finally <gasps> get to the surface and breathe, and I'm okay. And in working with this dream, I had a couple of realizations about it. And the one that I'm remembering right now is, well, there's actually a couple I'm remembering right now. One is during the whole time of the pandemic, one of the major symptoms is breath of having trouble breathing. And people were going to the hospital and being put on ventilators before there were vaccines. And even now still, if they're immune compromised, so catching your breath has been something we've been struggling with at a literal level during the pandemic and at a metaphoric level. Have we been able to catch our breath? Have we been able to get enough fresh air as we struggle with the various um, events that the world has been throwing at us? Those, those are two levels of the gasping for breath. And then the third one hit me as I was writing the chapter in the book. I had that dream right after the George Floyd incident where he was kneeled on until he died because, and was saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And that found its way into my dream. Hmm. It sounds like maybe your dream was also mirroring collective trauma. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the things that makes dreams so powerful because dreams have many simultaneously true layers. They're not only about one thing. There are a number of different layers that are simultaneously true. And one of the layers of dreams is that we can dream not only for ourselves, but we can dream for others and dream for the world. And Carl Jung called this connection with sort of the world unconscious, our collective unconscious. So using your exact word, we can dream for the collective. And when we make the connection between our personal dream and something that's happening in the larger world, we then have an opportunity not only to do healing for ourselves, but healing for our world and for the planet as well. Um, in Hebrew, there's a phrase called tikkun olam, and that literally means repairing the world. When Barack Obama took his um, inauguration oath, he actually used that phrase that he was called to office because he wanted to be a part of Tikkun Olam, of repairing the world. So we can do our own little piece of Tikkun Olam, of repairing the world, when we do active dream work, and then take action in the world on whatever knowledge and insight our dreams have shared with us. Just a couple days ago, while I was preparing for this interview, in fact... A friend of mine told me that her child had a fever and texted me and asked me to pray and send positive energy for her child to heal. That night, I went to bed and I had an intention to discover and have a dream as to what would help her child. 
that night I dreamt that this child was in their, this is a pre-adolescent child, they were in their bedroom, very unhappy, hiding, with, withdrawing, and their parents, um, the child's parents were in the living room having a great time, having a lot, a lot of fun. However, when I went in to talk to the child, they told me that the parents, while they were having a good time, there were things that were not being said that this child was picking up on and was causing the child to not feel well. Mm. So I told my friend this, and I, I think they're still processing the information, but she did give me permission to share <laughs> this story here uh, today. You're a strong dreamer. I think so. <laughs> yeah. So you did, I mean, a number of different things here. One is you responded with sort of compassion and generosity to your friend's um, telling you that her, her child was sick and offered to set an intention and, and offer prayers and blessings for the child's healing by uh, intending to do that at night before going to sleep. You did what's called dream incubation. So you basically set your mind and your intention to have a dream, um, on behalf of this child and this family for healing. So dream incubation means we, we go to sleep at night with a question or an intention or a dilemma that we'd like the answer to. And then we record the dreams that we remembered that night on the same page as the question. You didn't necessarily need to write it down because you remembered it really well, but to, to ensure remembering, I always encourage people to keep a journal and write them down. And then you picked up in your dream on something not just from the collective unconscious, but potentially from the specific collective unconscious of the family system and family dynamics in your friend's family. Whether or not you knew what was going on, you shared the dream with your friend, which is the next step, so that she could figure out what your dream meant to her and her child. And it sounds like from her response to your dream, that she got some ahas from your dream and can then go forward to having some conversations with her child and with the family to sort out whatever these unspoken uh, problems or issues are. Yeah. Nice work. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and that seems to echo in a lot of family systems, I would imagine. Sure. Things that aren't said are still there, right? Secrets unspoken words from our lifetime, from family history, from intergenerational traumatic or positive things are still carried, you know, through our system, through our physical system, through our family system. And there's a power in speaking the words. And sometimes the dreams come through to tell us in stories and words and pictures, things that we know in our unconscious, but we haven't yet been able to bring them up to our consciousness. But the dreams help open that portal, open that door to access the information we need in order to clean out the clean out the closet um, from the skeletons that might have been buried there. How do you differentiate between dream work and dream interpretation? So this goes back to sort of the philosophy and the ethics that are part of the dream work background that I'm a part of. I'm a member of an organization called IASD, which is the International Association for the Study of Dreams. And part of the ethics of this organization are that the dreams belong to the dreamer. Your dream is your dream. And I can't presume to tell you what your dream means. The final arbiter of what the dream means is the dreamer, him or herself. I can have ideas. I can have my own resonance with your dream. I can have thoughts about the dream that as a dream worker, I might offer to you and I might ask you questions and I might say, I'm wondering if, or what about this? Does this feel right? And then you get to say yes or no to it. So we'll work together in a collaborative process to figure out what are the meanings and the messages of your dream to you. But I'm not coming from a position of power and authority top down to tell you what your dream means. That's the difference between dream work and dream interpretation. Mm -hmm. With helping people with healing trauma, it sounds like you primarily use dream work and then you assist them with their dream interpretation. 
So when I'm working with people who have a trauma history, I don't necessarily start with dream work and I don't only use dream work. Um, that's one of many methods that I use with people, but I'm trained in a large number of integrated body mind therapies that specifically help people heal from trauma, such as, for example, EMDR, which stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, which is one of the most powerful um, tools for working through and healing from trauma. In addition to that, I work from a somatic perspective using somatic experiencing, which is Peter Levine's work. I use Gestalt therapy, Fritz Perl's work. I use focusing, which is Eugene Gendlin's work. And I do a variety of integrated um, spiritual and energy medicine approaches. So I'm trained in, in tapping, what's colloquially called tapping, which is EFT, emotional freedom technique, and TAT, and then working from a real pan spiritual perspective, both from whatever a person's own belief system is and their own relationship with spirituality, as well as reaching out and connecting with spiritual traditions that they may or may not be as familiar with, ranging from shamanism to paganism to the Kabbalah, to Sufi mysticism, to Hindu gods and goddesses, where, wherever they find their, their spiritual resources. How do you use dreams to help people heal from trauma? That's a great question. And, and that, you know, sort of hits the nail on the head. It's one of many methods that I use with people. So for starters, I always invite people to bring their dreams to therapy. Or if I'm working in a non-therapeutic setting, we make connections between the dream that they're sharing and things that have been happening in their life. But if someone is coming to me specifically um, as a client or as a consultant, with the purpose of healing from things that have gone on in their life after, you know, doing an intake and doing initial interviews. I, as part of that, I always say, tell them that one of the ways I work is through paying attention to their dreams. And I, and I joke and I say, you know, if you, if you keep track of your dreams, it's free therapy every night, right? Because you can get so much wisdom from your dreams. And if to the end you bring them and we talk about them and you talk about them with other people, you will find the insights and the connections that uh, relate to things that you are struggling with. And then part of the dream work, which is connected to some of the methods that I describe in my book that I've created, the method of doing the dream work helps people to get more of a sense of self-efficacy and empowerment and safety in their dream so that they can confront the difficult and frightening dreams or dream characters they have from a place of empowerment rather than fear and then literally change their dreams mm -hmm. which then will change their life can you give an example of how you help someone heal from trauma using dreams i know you use other methods um, but dreams are a significant focus so much that you even wrote a book on it let me start with one person came to see me and, and she's an adult and she's a, a, um, in her fifties and among other things was talking about, um, a night, nightmares that she had of being in a hospital room, of being held down, of having some invasive medical procedure. Yeah. So, and she didn't understand why she was having these dreams because she hadn't in her adult life had that happen recently. It wasn't a recent event. So in exploring where these dreams might come from, one of the questions I asked her was, was that ever her experience? Did she ever have an experience, you know, when she was younger, when she was a child of being in a hospital room? And then she remembered that when she was a child, she had a series of um, of UTIs, of urinary tract infections, that were not responding to regular medical treatment. And she was taken to a, a hospital room and was subject to some pretty invasive procedures to try to figure out what was going on. And to make matters worse, at that time, for some reason, they wouldn't let her mother in the room. So she was alone with the docs and the nurses who weren't particularly empathic and it wasn't, it wasn't a children's hospital like we, we would hope um, that we would get treatment for our kids today. So anyway, when she told me that, my response to her was, oh, I'm so sorry. That must have been really traumatic. And she said, I never thought of it like that. 
He said, could that be a trauma? I said, yes, there is a whole category of trauma called medical trauma. And it sounds like not only did you have an painful invasive procedure, but you were left alone and you didn't have your mom there to support you. So it was like double whammy. So just naming it for starters helped her say, oh my God, I never realized that that was a trauma in my life. And then she could begin to name things that were connected with that in her life that were kind of related, including, of course, the dream that she had, which was almost a replay in some ways of the experience she had gone through some 40, 50 years ago. So there's that's one layer. That sounds like a very literal dream. <laughs> In, in, in this case, it was. Um, there are often dreams that are metaphorical as well. One of the things we did with this dream was she named that being alone and being so scared was one of the hardest parts of the experience. So I invited her to bring resources now back into the dream and back into the event so that she wouldn't be alone anymore. And one of the things that's so powerful is that we know really from quantum physics that time is not linear. We think time is linear and we talk about it as being linear, but actually we do have the ability to tra traverse the past and the future. Um, and time is more like a Mobius strip than a straight line. So I asked her, what kind of resources would she want to bring back into the dream with her? And in addition to naming some friends, that she wanted to bring with her, she had had another dream based on the TV show um, Xena Warrior Princess, was this powerful figure of this empowered woman warrior. And she said, I'm going to bring Xena Warrior Princess in with me to keep me safe and protect me there. So we brought her friends and Xena Warrior Princess, and she invited some of her pets into the room to create a healing circle into the dream. And when we finished, we talked about that distress level before. It had been about an eight when she told me the dream. When we finished bringing the resources and the healing protective images into the dream with her, and they helped her feel accompanied and not alone, her distress level was down to a three. And that was in just an hour. And we continued working with that until we could take the charge off both the dream and the original incident. And when you were working with her, was this in a therapeutic setting versus her actually recreating the dream again while sleeping at night? Or did she do both? Both. She brought it to a session that we were having a therapeutic setting and then she would practice. So there's a form of um, dream work called IRT, image rehearsal therapy. And if you create in your waking life, images, stories, resources that help you resolve the dream in a more positive way, you practice them at night before going to sleep. You incubate, right? Like we were talking about before, these images, these stories, these new endings that you can have. And then you dream forward and you can continue to bring healing into the dreams as you add resources until such time as either A, the dream has no more charge to it, or B, you're just not having the dream anymore, and you're dreaming about pleasant things. Mm -hmm. And then I would imagine that their life that they live during the day hours improves as well. Right. Some people that I've worked with talk about having what they call a dream hangover. They are so distressed at night and have such disturbing dreams that they wake up exhausted and feel hungover all the rest of the day. So the nightmares infiltrate not just their sleeping life, but affect their waking daily life as well. What are some other methods that you use to help people heal from trauma using dreams? One of the centerpieces in actually both of the books is the method that I designed called the Gaia Method. And it stands for Guided Active Imagination Approach. And it's based on a combination of Jungian style active imagination work and a lot of the what we call best practice trauma treatment. I've named some of the modalities, particularly EMDR. So, and 
I, my, my colleagues in my, in my dream circle actually helped me come up with the name, with the acronym. And I love that it's the acronym of Gaia, which is the, the feminine earth, uh, presence of, of the, uh, sentient nature of the land that we live on. So I love that it's, it's both, uh, both and. So in this Gaia method, there were originally two parts in the first book. And then between the first and the second, I added a, an additional bridge. So there's a third part. So part one in the Gaia method is the ingathering of allies and resources. So when someone talks about their dream or their nightmare, after I ask them if they want to share the dream or nightmare, I ask them if they want to work on it. And they, if they say yes, I then say, well, let's make sure that you have enough safety to be able to work on this dream without doing what's called abreacting, which is having a negative emotional response to it. Because the last thing we want to do is re-traumatize someone by doing dream work. And I have had people come to me sort of re-traumatized from what people have said to them about their dreams. One woman said to me, I, I talked with some friends of mine about my dream and they said they thought I was having a psychotic break and I needed to go to the hospital. Do you think that's what's going on? I said, well, no. After I had taken a history from her, I said, no. These are people who really didn't understand the nature of dreams. Let's work with this dream and see what's going on here. So in trauma treatment, we go only as fast as the slowest part can keep up because we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. So I use that same principle in working with dreams or nightmares that have sourced in trauma. We want to make sure that all the parts of us and all the characters in our dream are feeling safe enough to go in and confront or talk to or deal with in whatever way they're going to deal with the scary monster or the tidal wave or the alien that's come to, to, uh, take over their body or whatever it is in, in their nightmare. So we set up with a whole series of questions that I ask about what do you need to feel safe? Who would you like to bring in? I talked about this a little bit before and where I expand on Jung's active imagination is I add not just people, but are there objects you'd like to bring with you? Um, do you want to bring an invisibility cloak? Would you like to bring a a magic sword, you know, would you like to bring, surround yourself with a bubble of light? Um, do you want to bring, one person who I worked with brought her cell phone. And she said, I'm going to bring my cell phone because I can always call if I, if I get stuck. And my cell phone has a flashlight too. So if it's dark in there, I could put the flashlight on my phone. And I thought that was a, a brilliant uh, resource <laughs> to bring, to bring with her. So we bring people, whether they're alive or dead, real or imaginary. Some of the kids I work with bring their favorite cartoon characters. Um, one little girl brought Mary Poppins with her, um, to keep her safe in her dream work. And so we gather all the resources we need first. And then the bridge is with all these resources, take a peek back inside the dream before you go there, before we work on it, and see if there are any resources inside the dream that you might not have noticed first time round, or that show up now that you look more closely. Was there a helpful bright figure in the dream? Was there um, a magic penny that you didn't notice the first time you were there that can help keep you safe? So I invite them to look around inside the dream, connect with the resources that they already had and maybe just didn't notice or recognize. And then with all the resources from outside the dream and all the resources they found inside the dream, then we move into part two, which is work with the nightmare, work with the scary things that are going on to see what kind of change, transformation, um, resources you need to help them quiet down, to help them heal, to help them leave you alone if that's what they're supposed to do, um, sometimes to banish them if that's what's needed. Mm. Wonderful. So the, the, that Gaia method takes us slowly and carefully through the terrain of a traumatic nightmare in a way that won't trigger additional traumatic responses. Do you advise people on lucid dreaming so that they can work more actively uh, and with more awareness while dreaming? If people are interested in lucid dreaming, I think that's a wonderful additional tool. And what lucid dreaming means briefly is that what, cause you and I know, but your, your listeners might not, is that you're aware 
while you're asleep and dreaming that you're asleep and dreaming. So you're awake in your dream in a sense. So it gives you a meta layer of consciousness to really be able to have um, efficacy and control it within your dream in a way that you didn't originally. So if you are skilled and practiced in lucid dreaming and you become aware that you're dreaming while you're dreaming, then you can make choices right inside the dream. Then you can say, I'm going to turn right instead of left here. I'm going to say no instead of yes to the screen character. I'm going to have a wall come up right now in my dream between me and the monster that's chasing me that the monster can't get through or over. And you have some choices to make inside of your dream. Um, the one thing that I caution people about with lucid dreaming is we want to be careful not just to immediately run away or fly away from the scary figure in our dream. And here's why. Sometimes those scary figures, or often those scary figures, are come are coming to us because there's information that they need to tell us. There's something in, that we need to know or that they need to know, and they come with some kind of a gift. Here's the transformational possibilities of working with the nightmares. If we banish them too quickly, we don't get the gift. So that's why we spend a lot of time in safety and protection first, so that you're strong enough to face up to the nightmare figure and have a conversation and have a dialogue and find out What's the gift they brought you? It could be a gift of information. It could be a, a magic a jewel. It could be a gift of, of connection. It could be a gift of a flower bulb that you're supposed to go out and plant in your garden and nurture and watch grow. It could be a literal or a metaphoric gift. So if someone is doing lucid dreaming, I would just say, be careful you're not cutting off a possibility of receiving a gift from your dream before you run away from the nightmare. Right, because you said that all dreams bear gifts, even the frightening ones. Right. That's right. And part of the healing then is to find buried in the frightening dreams, what's the information? How, how are we going to change, say, a family pattern, right? Where we get to say the buck stops here. If we don't know what we can do differently or what the gift is, if we don't recognize that Wow, there's this family pattern. Here we're talking about sort of um, ancestral intergenerational trauma, for example. There's a family pattern that men in my family have affairs on their wives. Wow, how are we going to change that pattern if we don't recognize it? How are we going to do something different? If we bring it up to consciousness through whatever the dream was, the metaphor, the symbol in the dream, we can then in our waking life make a decision about how to react and respond in our own choices in partnerships and relationships. Since consciousness is consciousness, <laughs> is it possible for people to go into a meditation or work with somebody such as yourself and use various methods such as the Gaia method, active imagination, imagery work, and actually resolve, you know, get the gift from the dream, resolve it so they don't actually have to attempt that while they're having their dream while sleeping? Oh, absolutely. It Sometimes it can happen in a flash that the aha, if it really resonates through our whole body-mind system, if it's a single incident traumatic event or small T trauma, it can really be on occasion one and done. More often, it'll take doing some continued work, particularly with repetitive dreams and nightmares that are bothering us. But yes, there are many layers to consciousness and being in meditation is a different layer of consciousness. You can put yourself into a light trance. You can do hypnotherapy work. You can alter your consciousness with various medicinal or plants. Um, and you can have a waking dream experience where you put your intention on looking for a symbol or a metaphor or an answer to your question as you walk around in your waking life. And then when you find it, it'll be the equivalent of having the dream about it in your sleep. Yeah. Emotions seem to be a significant component to be aware of when doing dream work. Right. The, the emotional narrative, if you will, is what makes the difference between a dream and a nightmare. So when 
if you're talking with a friend or with a partner about dreams and they tell you their dreams after they've told you the story like this happened then that happened if they haven't already said and this is how i felt in, in the beginning of the dream in the middle of the dream at the end of the dream the next important thing to do or one of the important things to do is to say and how did you feel what were your emotions when the dream opened and in the middle and at the end of the dream because that emotional narrative is going to give you the clues as to what this dream is about so the same dream will mean two different things depending on your emotional response so if you and i both had a dream where we're walking down the road and we come across um, a dog in the middle of the road and we approach the dog and the dog starts approaching us and that's the dream okay we're meeting a dog on the road if in your dream this is a sweet friendly dog and he's wagging his tail and he's got his tongue out and he lets you pet him and maybe licks your hand and you feel really delighted and this is so nice I found a new friend that's one kind of dream if in my dream when I approach the dog, he starts to growl and he bares his teeth. And I'm thinking, oh no, this is a really angry dog. He's going to attack me. I better get out of here. That's a very different dream. That's a nightmare, right? Same dream, but our emotional response to what's going on makes it two different storylines. There may be people listening who are thinking to themselves now, well, the nightmare that I have is some dark entity or I have a curse, or there's some evil force coming my way, or they might believe that they are receiving telepathic messages somewhere. Right. It's, it's ironic that you're asking me today because literally last night I was on somebody else's show that deals a lot with the paranormal, and they were all over that topic. It was really interesting. And, and it turned out, as we talked about it, that one of the um, interviewers was a big uh, player of Dungeons and Dragons. So when he would have entities, he was not scared at all because it was like, oh, yeah, this is like, you know, the villain from my D&D &D game. And, you know, this is the evil spirit that I had conquered with my magic sword. And so it was a whole different layer of, of consciousness that it was good for me to be reminded of because I wouldn't have gone to gaming <laughs> uh, as my first thought uh, around, you know, entities and evil spirits, but it's so popular and common today that it was, it was a good reminder. Um, but yes, people can absolutely, and, and this is throughout history, right? Throughout recorded history, people have had nightmares and felt like they were being possessed by demons or um, the incubus or succubus that would, you know, take their soul in the middle of the night and have done variations on um, exorcisms to remove the, the evil spirit in Middle Eastern cultures, both in the um, Muslim culture and in the Sephardic Jewish culture. There's a, a hamsa, which is the hand of Fatima that people wear around their neck. Actually, I, I wear a hamsa myself. Um, it's a beautiful symbol um, that is technically or, or uh, metaphorically anyway, protection against the evil eye. So that you're protected against, you know, demons or, or dark beings coming in. Um, people hang a hamsa over the, the bed of their, of their newborn and their child. Um, Native Americans hang a dream catcher over the bed of their newborn and their child to snare the, um, evil spirits in the, and the bad dreams in the threads of the dream catcher. And in an authentic dream catcher, there's a hole in the middle that allows the good and pleasant dreams and positive entities to, to slip through into the, the, into the child below to help them in their life. So where I go with that with people is I'm not presupposing that I have the answer to, is this true? Is this not true? Is this real? Is this not real? I'm going with what's your felt sense? What does it feel like to you? And therefore, what do you need? So we design our healing work around these nightmares, depending on what their belief system is as to what is generating them. So we might invite Archangel Michael with his sword to come and, and protect us against the demons who are uh, invading us. We might invite someone to um, do a ritual cleansing, either a baptism or a mikvah 
or going into water and having a, an intention of clearing off any dark en energies when they bathe. Um, years ago, actually, um, one of my first trauma teachers, a woman named Ellen Bass, who I studied with um, learning to work with people who had a history of childhood sexual abuse, she said that as a therapist, every day after the end of the day, she would take off all of the clothes she had been wearing to do her work and take a shower. And in her mind, she would image washing anything that was icky or sticky or simply not hers off her, let it go down the drain, and then put on fresh clothes at the end of the day as this bridge between um, her workday world and her personal life. And I always remembered that. And, and I don't take it quite to that extent every day, but I always change my clothes mm -hmm. at the end of every day of work just to, you know, sort of clear off anything that, uh, that might have clung. Um, so we offer that option of, to people who are having dreams where they feel like something dark is, is clinging to them or has entered them. What do you need to do? Let's get creative together and be curious together to clean off or clean out anything that isn't yours that you don't need to carry. Mm, absolutely. Everyone will be different, like you say, as to what will help them in regards to bad dreams or nightmares, whether it's related to something psychological or physical that happened to them, or that they might say is more in the spiritual or parapsychological or paranormal realm. Right. That's right. Absolutely. Is there anything else you can share in the parapsychological or spiritual realm related to dreams, bad dreams, and nightmares? Yes. There are two Two things I can share. One are what are called precognitive dreams. The other are visitation dreams. So precognitive dreams are basically peeking around the corner of time so that we can dream ahead of things that haven't happened yet and sometimes get it right smack on the money or sometimes get really, really close. The only way we're going to know, however, if we've had a precognitive dream is if we're recording our dreams. And we can go back later and say, oh, wow, this thing that just happened, I dreamt that last week or last year. So there's another plug for paying attention to and keeping track of your dreams, because you may find as an intuitive, you can sense things that either have happened or are happening or will happen. And to be able to discern sometimes which is which is going to be very important. So you're paying attention both as you're picking up whatever energies you're picking up as an intuitive and in the same way using your our intuition in our dream work to say oh is this something that could be happening even if it hasn't yet let me notice let me pay attention let me also pay attention in my daily life to what are called synchronicities right those unexplained events like a deja vu that you just can't explain through normal, everyday, linear phenomena, but you know you've been here before, you know this has happened before, you know you've met this person before. So we, we tune in, that's why there's the precognitive level of parapsychological dreaming. And then the other point would be, there are people who dream of their departed relatives, and sometimes it's a dream, and the mom in your dream stands for something in your life or is a symbol or metaphor or is part of another storyline. And sometimes the departed come to visit. And they come, and depending again on what your belief system is, many, many people after the death of a beloved relative or pet for that matter as well, who, you know, my, my cats are my relatives. I don't know about you have pets or not. They come and visit. And to differentiate, are you having a dream that's a symbol or a metaphor, or are you having a visit, is usually simply about the, the vividness of the encounter. The quality, is there a felt sense of that person is with you? Can you, can you, he like when my dad visits me, I, I feel his presence in the room with me and I can kind of hear the, the sound of his voice speaking in my ear. And I, and I know he's right there which is different than if I had a dream about him and I might not feel his presence so vividly. So that's the other part. Um, and it's really helpful when people are grieving to be able to tap in. And sometimes our departed are just kind of waiting around the corner of time and space to be invited. 
So if you would like to connect with someone who has departed and they haven't visited you yet in your dreams, they either they're not ready yet, if it's too soon, maybe they're hanging out in the Bardo and in the in-between places, or they're still getting settled, you know, over on the other side, and they're not quite ready to visit. But sometimes they're just waiting for an invitation. So you can invite them before you go to sleep, and, and often they will respond to that. That's a beautiful suggestion of how to connect with those who are on the other side. And I'm so glad you're able to connect with your father. Um, what does that do for you around your physical loss of your father to have him visit you in dreams? It makes it less of a loss. So his physical body isn't here anymore. And, you know, I can't hug him in the same way that I could hug him in life. But I can have a dream hug. And I can hear his advice in a dream or his, his suggestions. And so I still, I feel a stronger sense of connection. And, and in our family, it's, we, we talk about it, you know, our, our relatives, our departed relatives, you know, very easily and commonly. And when, when my daughter was young, and even now she's, she's a young adult, um, and you say, if you have a, an issue or a dilemma that you're struggling with, I'd say, go ask Bobby and Zadie. What do they think? So she'd ask my grandmother, her grandmother, my parents and grandfather, who both have passed. You know, they both died. But she'll go and ask them. Sometimes, I don't know exactly what she did, but sometimes in a dream. And she always comes back with a really good suggestion or idea. So is she channeling them? Is she imagining it? Is she having a dream? Are they visiting her? I don't know, but it doesn't matter. Because she comes back with good advice when she tunes into that. Psychic mediums will frequently share that the information they receive uh, for their, the people they're supporting, that they can get verifiable information. And Evelyn Elsasser, who's just completed and is actually, it's an ongoing study, a uh, long-term study on spontaneous after-death communications, talks about how sometimes people are able to get information that's accurate. Sometimes people are visited by somebody who who has died but they didn't know they were they were dead it was maybe just a matter of a few moments before um william peters talks about this and he's been doing research and it was even published in a hospice and palliative care journal about people who are able to have shared death experiences um and sometimes those can occur even when they don't know that their loved one is about to pass i'm just nodding and agreeing with you yeah. And then the precognitive dreams. Sometimes people will, and quite frequently, I believe, people will have dreams of natural disasters that are about to happen. I think there's been many stories of people who had dreams before 9-11 occurred. But, you know, what do you do with that information when you receive it? We are first and foremost animal beings. And we have instincts like all animals. So we know there are many, many stories of animals who start running for the hills way before our um, electronic equipment has picked up on the fact that a tsunami is coming and is going to flood the, the, the shore any, any moment. The animals are already taking off because they instinctively can feel it. We see that with the wildfires that are happening out west as well. The animals are, are running often Unfortunately, not always, but often they're trying to get away before we even know how bad the fire is. So the question then is, if we receive what might be precognitive information, what do we do with it? Well, we write it down. We make a note. We pay attention to it. If it has to do with someone in our life that we know, we have the option of passing on the information to them, much in the way that you did with your friend when you had the dream about her family and her, her child. We can say, hey, I had this dream or I had this thought come through and I don't know if this means something to you, but maybe you want to pay attention or maybe you want to check it out or at least let me tell you what I dreamed about or what I'm thinking about so you can pay extra attention um, if, if you want to on this. So you can give people a heads up on things that you have uh, precognitively dreamed. And they're not always negative things. They could be positive things too. That wouldn't be in the nightmare category. You know, you could say, I dream that you just met the love of your life and it's going to happen sometimes in, sometime in this year. I don't know where or when, but it had to do with hiking in the woods. 
And your friend says, I don't know. But then sure enough, eight months later, they're walking on a, on a hike with the Appalachian Mountain Club. And, you know, the person they're walking with turns out to be someone that they end up dating and then getting engaged to and bearing. I mean, could be that. Um, but we want to make sure that we don't get a reputation for being like Cassandra from Greek mythology because she was an intuitive precognitive um, dreamer and intuitor, only she only dreamt bad things happening or only intuited disasters. So people would start to like run in the opposite direction when they saw her approaching them. <laughs> so we, we have to be judicious and careful as well with what we're sharing so we don't just become the harbinger of, of bad news. Because um, sometimes there's nothing we can do for other people, and sometimes there is. So there's the the judgment call to make as well. And we, we, we think we're getting information coming through. Yeah, that's good advice. Uh, there are announcing dreams where typically it's the mother will dream of their child before they're pregnant. And I had that happen with three of my nieces and nephew. I knew that they were pregnant uh, before before the mother knew, before uh, she was even had any biological indications or had a pregnancy test. That's great. Yeah, I've, I'm familiar with that. And actually, a good co friend and colleague of mine, Kim Mascaro, um, wrote a book about announcing dreams and, and birth dreams and um, talked about this phenomenon as well. So it's pretty, it's, it's pretty common if, we're, if you pay attention to it. It's wonderful. Linda, is there anything else you want to share about healing trauma with dreams? Healing is always possible. And it's finding people that you can be accompanied by because you don't have to do the journey by yourself. Um, Judith Jordan from the Stone Center at Wellesley College said that healing happens when we can return to the pain of the past and find that this time we are no longer alone. So I, I read that, I don't know, 20 years ago or more, and it's always stuck with me as such a powerful message. And the opportunity to change from the PTSD, from a post-traumatic stress disorder, to what I call in the last chapter of my book, PTSG, post-trauma spiritual growth, is available to us as we connect and do our work and pay attention. We get to find the spiritual growth. We get to um, grow even stronger and more solid than we were before the traumas happen. And I think the last thing maybe that I'll say for today is the, the metaphor, the image of kintsuki, which is the Japanese art of repairing pottery that has been broken. And they repair the pottery that has been broken with gold. And they weld the gold through the pieces of pottery to create a new, more beautiful whole. And the message in Kintsuki is that sometimes or often that we are more beautiful and valued for having been broken and repaired than never had been broken at all. That is a beautiful message and a beautiful metaphor for how we can all heal. Thank you so much, Linda, for being with me today and helping us with spiritual growth. Thank you very much for having me on the show. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us.